Hello, and welcome to the June edition of the Nutritionist Webinar 2016. I'm Mary Ann Fezenden from Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems, and I serve as your English language host. The purpose of these webinars is to pr promote access to technical seminars on a range of topics delivered by internationally recognized speakers. This series is a unique three-language presentation held in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Noted ruminant nutritionists will present in English, hosted by AMTS in the United States, while Marcos Neves Pereira from the University of Ravras hosts in Brazil, as, Mar as Marcelo Hens Ramos from 3R Lab translates into Portuguese. Paula Torillo hosts and translates into Spanish for Argentina. There will be, there will be a post presentation question and answer period during which listeners can submit questions through me, Mar Marcos, and Paula. A complete recording of archived webinars as well as a question and answer period question and answer session for each will be available on the 3R and AMTS website. We are very pleased to be hope hosting Dr. William Prokop. And no, he is not a cat, but he won't give me a picture, so this is what happens. A nutritionist veterinarian who frequently is called in by the industry and fellow nutritionists to help troubleshoot in nutritional problems in dairy herds. Bill and Attica Veterinarian Associates, Veterinary Associates are contracted to manage the Cornell University Ruminant Center under the business entity of Dairy 8. Bill has extensive experience working in large herds throughout the United States. Focus on his approach to determining and solving nutritionally and management-based challenges to optimum perform performance. Our presentation is a little different, different this time. It's because we have audience members and we are broadcasting from the basement of Morrison Hall on Cornell campus. Our fellow attendees to the Cornell Advanced Nutrition Conference are off at the Wednesday night barbecue. We, on the other hand, are feeling quite fancy and have wine and cheese. With that, I will hand over the presentation to Bill. Thank you, Marianne, and good evening, everyone. So the topic for this evening's discussion is ration forensics, or when good rations turn bad. And as a troubleshooter, when I embrace problems on a dairy, I like to ask two questions. If a ration did not work, do we know why? But more importantly, if it did work, do we know why? And is it repeatable? And that often is the real question that we're trying to resolve. A little bit of my pedigree, I am Cornell raised and uh, bred, so I've got my degrees from this prestigious university. And I want to give you a little insight into the uh, structure of our business. As Marianne said, we're uh, a vet practice, AVAPC, and we have many business entities. And the entity that um, does this consulting and troubleshooting is uh, Dairy Innovations. And it's comprised of several individuals besides myself that are either academicians or partners in the practice, and we are engaged by industry, nutritionists, um, dairymen to do troubleshooting to resolve problems on dairy. So back to the questions. <clears throat> if a ration did not work, do we know why? Or if it stopped working? There's a lot of quantitative and qualitative factors that go into this. It's real easy to do the quantitative. We all do that. We model with one or more platforms, usually based off of CNCPS 6.5. And they are models because with the proper inputs, they can predict exactly what's going wrong and direct us to the wrong assumptions we may have made in the process of formulating. These things are very attractive because we have the security of numbers through analyses. And if we don't utilize labs for robust contemporary analyses of these seeds, especially with regard to fiber digestibilities, starch digestibilities, those attributes, the models will not work. And that's the easy part of this, is getting the right numbers into the right model and understanding um, what is predictive. The more subtle problem comes in the qu less quantifiable management factors. These are not as sexy as numbers. We don't have four decimal places to hide behind but they are no less significant. And I, I won't want to go through some of these to uh, highlight what the real issues when rations don't work usually end up. <clears throat> so back in 98 is when I started on this quest to 
dissect ration analysis and understand when problems occur on dairies, I took a sabbatic leave from our group and I went to work for a company, Monsanto Dairy Business, who had launched Pozolac, which is recombinant uh, bovine somatotropin, which is available in the U.S. and some other countries. Um, and I was tech service for them. And I was stationed in the Southwest, where the dairies are on the larger scale, typically two to 4,000. And what we did on these dairies was we looked to optimize management and herd performance in order to improve farm profitability through the applied technology that Monsanto. What we learned was that technology works best when best management practices improve consistency and reduce variation on the dairy. Improve consistency and reduce variation on the dairy. Well, guess what? <clears throat> this was consistent with the message that was be ad being advocated by real industry. Improvement through process control. William Edward Deming is probably one of the fathers of process control and quality. And he said it best, if I had to reduce my message to management to just a few words, I'd say it all has to do with reducing variation, which is something that we must recognize in the dairy industry. The job of management is not supervision, but leaders is our job to set the pace so people want to reduce variation. And if they don't want to change to do this, he has to do that too. It is not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. So with that, the corollary I always tell my clients is every business owner has the right to mismanage his or her business to the extent that their equity will allow. So. This inspired me to want to understand process control, and at the time, Six Sigma was the foremost uh, upcoming process control concept. And the concepts are very basic and simple to any process control. You recognize, recognize the negative impact of variation. You capitalize on opportunities to improve consistency. You try to improve accuracy in everything you do. You have a process control system in place, whether it's Six Sigma or total quality management. You measure in order to manage, and you recognize that data that you capture is only as good as the integrity of the data, and that's whether that's feed samples or whether that's dairy comp, statistics for the herd, management, whatever. So when we look at a problem, we try to define the specific problem. We want to measure to capture good data that will help us resolve the problem. We analyze relevant data to come up with a solution. We improve by implementing uh, the solution and verifying that it works. And then we control it by verifying the stability of the improvement that we've made, that it's going to continue and remain robust and be repeatable. This is true of any time we go after a problem on any industry or dairy situation, these principles will apply in order to maintain a consistent process improvement. So let me give you a, a real-time example of process control. In Amsterdam, under the Schiffel urinals, that area would pass inspection in an operating room, but nobody notices. What everybody does notice is that in each urinal has a fly. Look harder, and the fly turns into the black outline of a fly, etched into the porcelain. It improves the aim. If a man sees a fly, he aims at it. Fly and urinal research found that etchings reduce spillage by 80%. It gives a guy something to think about, and that's the perfect example of process control. How I started with process control in my early attempts at uh, feeding system excellence as a nutritionist started with monitoring TMR consistency by using 10,000 gumballs in each load as a marker. Add 10,000 gumballs, mix in accordance with protocol, capture the TMR in plastic tubs during feed out, and count gumballs to verify consistency. And in this instance, it turned out to be one of the coldest days in January on record. Here we are in the steam and fog of the dairy with the tubs, catching the TMR, shaking it out, and counting the gumballs, which you can see on the upper left. And the purpose here was to compare several TMR mixers to see if the distribution of gumballs in each of the mixers was comparable or if one of the mixers did a better job of consistency.
we had three mixtures that we were doing a trial for. Documenting process control is a tremendous opportunity for all nutritionists and troubleshooters in the field. And it starts with the basics. There's a mantra that we have is that just because people can do certain things doesn't mean they do. And the corollary is that there's no job so simple on a dairy that it can't be done wrong. So one of the basic ones, which I still find is at the crux of a lot of issues, is dry matter determination. And one of the things I want to know is which feeds are done, how many samples of each feed are done when dry matters are determined, by who, how often, who enters the data, and how big a shift in dry matter is made if that occurs, and is weather ever factored in to dry matter changes in anticipation of um, rain or snow that might reduce the dry matter. So one of the simplest tools that I found that worked for large dairies was to implement forced air drying ovens. And these would have a 24 sample capacity so that I could do multiple samples of each feed. They're thermostatically controlled so that we could let them run at about 100 degrees Celsius to dry out the feeds for four to six hours. And you can come back and weigh the pans and get the residual weight and know the dry matter. It's a very simple, passive system, and it improved the accuracy of feeding tremendously because it was effortless to do these dry matters. Mix integrity. If we look at the software that many dairies use to feed their cows, we find that the information that is captured is underutilized. As an example, this is a normal printout from a feed watch that shows different minerals being added and the timestamp when they started and when they stopped. And this looks pretty innocuous, but notice this. He left the mineral shed and added the, the last of the minerals at 7, 20, and 36. At 7, 20, and 46, 10 seconds later, Okay, he had delivered 235 pounds of soil 48 to that load. So that means any mineral that was left went back to the, to the commodity where the mineral was, was dropped. Then he went and got the soy 48, came back to the mixer, and put that in and delivered 235 pounds in 10 seconds. That's not very likely, okay? And it often points to the fact that he probably had residual mineral in his bucket paused for a few seconds, and then started dropping that in for the soy 48. These type of timestamps point out opportunities where people are cutting corners or just being lazy, where we can uh, improve consistency and quality by showing feeders that management has an eye. More, more hands-on evaluation can be done in the, the form of Penn State particle separator boxes, which we've all used it is a very effective tool for demonstrating consistency of delivery, adequacy of particle size, texture of the TMR, evidence of sorting, and the system that works very well, however, it is very time consuming. Here are samples that I have on the tailgate of my truck from a 3,000 cow dairy where I was working full time. It was one of five that I was helping manage. And getting consistency of the feeding system organized and documented on that those dairies was a priority for me. You'd say that you don't really need a Penn State box to elucidate the fact that there's a lot of inconsistency in the feeding on this particular dairy. But if you don't demonstrate it to the right people and show them that it can be captured, they will never strive to improve. And here's what weeks, if not months, of persistency of shaking rations out was able to achieve, they could see that the results were improving themselves, and so they were inspired to do a better job. As I said, this takes a lot of time, but the rewards were well worth it, especially for the dairyman. And certainly, photo capture of things like bird nesting to demonstrate excessive sorting. Um, and with regard to sorting, all cows do it to the degree the ration will allow. So that's something we have to accept. It's a matter of bringing it under control. Also, manure analysis, 
to understand what is passing through the cow, digested and undigested. And here, a fairly consistent manure sample has been washed, and you can see residual fiber. Here we see that there's corn coming through, okay, indicating that starch is passing through the large bowel where it could present a problem in terms of precipitating hemorrhagic bowel syndrome. And if nothing else, it's the fact that that corn has not been utilized to make milk or grow muscle. Um, and the equipment side of this being hands-on, as a veterinarian and a nutritionist learning that, I've also got to be somewhat of a mechanic and understand how to evaluate whether or not augers are thick enough if the knife placement is correct, if the knives are sharp enough, if they're missing knives, if some are broken off, and little subtle pieces of the auger, known as the kicker as an example on the flighting here, if that's missing, the mixing stops almost completely and just works like a washing machine and goes up and down instead of tumbling and turning. These are all very subtle little things that have to be evaluated in order to understand if the ration is not being delivered in a form that's consistent. The ultimate goal is to create an awareness of reducing this variation, and it can't be quantitated entirely. Um, it's not as simple as doing feed analyses and putting a ration together. It's a lot of touchy-feely things that we have to demonstrate. But as the Latin QED indicates, when scientific experiment, experimental proof is not feasible, let proof by common sense and logical deduction prevail. And you have to sell the importance of this to the guy that's doing the work, and then most importantly, to the guy that pays the bill. So just to prove that it does work with persistence, here are four TMRs that were analyzed. These samples came from four different bunks, delivered by two different feeders at different times during the day. Now, the, the, the numbers are fine, so I'll display them graphically. As you can see, dry matters were consistent, no surprise. Crude protein across the samples lines up perfectly. If you look at all of these values, they all are superimposable, okay? They're identical. And again, this was two 3,000 cow dairies back to back that share one common feed area. The only variation that there was was in the starch. It ranged from 28 to 23. However, some of that's analytical because I, the NFC total with sugar was about 31 across all of these numbers. Okay, so that was consistent as well. So the point being, with diligence, we got that dairy in line. We were able to control the controllable and we reduced the out of control. And how is that done? It's simple. You measure repeatedly, you reduce variation, you don't react to noise, you monitor everything until you know why you shouldn't, you pay attention to details, and you make sure people buy in by management doing what they're So here is, at our research dairy, an example of some of the variation that we see in forage sampling. The corn silage is its bottom line, and you can see that that's very consistent, and that's what you'd expect because corn silage tends to be a uniform crop. The black line is haylage, and this is in a bag, and you see the drift by field of the, the protein. And the white line is a process alfalfa hay, and it bounces around a lot, and it suggests sampling error because to all the same bales from the same field at the same time, but it's evident that as it was subsampled, some of the leaves perhaps were lost, and that's why the crude protein was variable. And this, of course, could throw off the ration formulation just because of the noise in this system. Um, so here's an example of mixing accuracy. And as you can see on the research dairy that we manage, the error is very small um, of the inclusion of the ingredients that are mixed. And here, this is a typical scenario that plays out on all dairies. You see the most noise, the most variation when you have a different feeder in, like the weekend feeders, where you see the spikes of the error, and then things occur like rain, and if, if rain dry matter changes are not anticipated and compensated for in advance by, say, reducing the dry matter of the forages a couple of points in advance of actual numbers, um, we'll get these kind of spikes 
just because they're picking up a lot more water with the feed. So here's diet composition. The left column is the, as measured by analyzing the diet that's delivered, and there's on the right is the numbers as formulated. And as you can see, they're pretty close. And that just proves the fact that diligence will pay off and you can get exact performance out of the ration because it is what you've predicted it or expected it to be. So further testimony that it can be done, here's three diets that were a research trial, A, B, and C. And you can see they're, they're all supposed to be equivalent diets, just have different ingredients to monitor the different performance of the ingredients with the same metrics of the diet. And I would defy, would defy anyone to, to do better than that. And again, it's, it's just a matter of setting the expectation for the feeder, coaching them, and demonstrating to them that it can be measured so they understand that monitoring is part of the process and they are more attentive to the job. So other attributes that are non-quantifiable is understanding whether feed is being delivered in time for it to perform properly just in time. In many instances, on birds, we see almost in time feeding, which does uh, evaluating that feed is pushed up regularly enough that the cows have access to it at all times, looking at compliance and lockup to understand that the diet is being consumed aggressively, that it's palatable, that the cows want to eat it, and making sure that the mix is uniform. To that end, looking at the bunks to make sure that feeds are maintained properly so to minimize spoilage and that they're used effectively, and also that inventory is adequate so they're not running out and having to substitute ingredients in the ration that you put together. And once again, looking at refusals in the bunk to understand if, in fact, the cows are sorting excessively and re refusing the fiber that you're assuming that they're eating, or perhaps some of the concentrate. And this is all about the concept of process. And I'll throw this in anecdotally. Um, result depend on attention to details and strategic patience. And I just happen to be there at the right time, but I take a lesson from this little raptor. It's, it's all about strategic patience for getting results, and the same is true with our dairies. We, we have a lot of changes that we want to implement, but we have to be thoughtful and understand which ones will make the most difference and do them progressively and slowly to get results. In terms of process control, we don't know what we don't know, and that's the problem. And so we can't do what we don't know, and we won't know until we measure, and then we tend not to measure what we don't value. So that being said, the best dairies use process control, and they put the interest of the cow before the convenience of the operator to, in order to minimize cow stress to optimize the performance of the ration. They don't do any one big thing right. They do all the little things right. When I was part of the five 3,000 cow units that I managed, one of my colleagues, Dr. Gordy Jones, was managing five 3,000 cow units next door. And he probably did more to advocate the covenant of cow comfort than any single individual I know in the U.S. besides Temple Grandin. And one thing he taught me and I'll, I'll emphasize this here, is that when it comes to ration performance, lactational performance, cow comfort is probably the biggest factor, not the ration itself, in terms of seeing those results. So I want to give an example of that with the commercialization of the Cornell University Research Dairy, which we now manage. Over this dairy in September 2012 to oversee the construction and optimize the cow comfort in it, it was, we're under a five-year contract, AVAPC, that's our headquarters. We're a traditional practice with many wings. This is when I was a real veterinarian and I had a truck with drugs and everything. I did all sorts of farm calls. We serve family farms ranging from 60 cows to 600 to dairies that have 6,000 cows. But the concepts were all the same. Address the needs of the cow, make her comfortable, and she will perform. So with that in mind, we undertook the uh, oversight of the construction of this new research facility depicted in this picture. Uh, there's the aerial from Google. The, the old facility is here, it's 40 years old, and we replaced it with the, the new dairy barn and a manure system aerially depicted here. And the barn is set up as this way. 
There's a floral barn here divided into pens of 16 because the parlor is double 16, so these are all research pens. So we load the parlor with a pen at a time. There's a freestyle barn that's a double uh, a six row that's just commercial, it's not used for research. There's our special needs barn where we have uh, dry cows, we have non saleable milk hospital area, and a maternity embedded pack. The bottom here we have a tie stall barn for individual cow evaluation, and uh, there's 80 tie stalls, and that's the front if you come to visit us. Okay, so to the point about optimizing cow performance through the environment we create and what we try to create here, I want to show you the day or the morning in the life of a typical cow at the Cornell University Ruminant Center. And here we are trying to achieve the best management practices that we understand to date to do this. So this is Dawn Patrol. It's about 5 a.m. in March. It's probably 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside. It's very quiet. You can see that there's feed in the alleys. These baffles because they're on a trial, and this feed is separate from that feed. And the sun is coming up, as you can see. The cows are just starting to rouse. Um, and we try to wake them up without a lot of noise. There, you can see there's a lot of good. Look at this. Look at this cow with her legs stretched out in front of her. What's wrong with this? And look, another one's doing it here. And here's, here's one that's got a hind leg up. Or this. Okay, another one. Why are they doing this? It's because they can. It's a form of them demonstrating how comfortable they are, that they can position themselves and stretch out any way they want. And it's testimony to the fact that those stalls provide comfort. And we know that they will, if it provide comfort, they will lie more. And if they lie more, we know from the work at Minor Institute that they're going to produce more milk for us. So throughout, throughout we have, we've tried to maintain ubiquitous comfort so the cows use the stalls as you can see here. Let's continue. It's about 5.30 now, and the wait staff comes to clear the table from the night before, and here we are picking up the residual feed and taking it down to weigh it back. We do weigh backs and all the pens, so we know. You'll also notice about that time, cows are starting to stir about and get up and move out of the pens. That's because housekeeping has arrived, okay, to groom the beds. Three times a day, the beds are raked by hand to smooth them out, remove, remove any soilage, and um, level the sand. These are all sand stalls. We clean the alleys with a vacuum tanker that passes down through in, a, in one sweep and sucks up all the manure, again, three times a day. And you notice that our girls move with the mission. There's no one behind them. They know they have to go to the parlor because their udders are so full they want to be milked. And here they are moving self-directed at self-controlled pace. There's no pushing of these cows. We call it droving. And basically all we're doing is guiding them to the right gates, to, through the right alleys, into the holding, holding area, walking up to the parlor, again, at their pace. And there you go. here we are loaded in the parlor. And as important of all, as all this is, is the attention to the the udders so that the cows are relaxed and have good letdowns of letdown of their milk. We foam pre-dip. We leave it on for contact time for wipe and dry. And when we're done, we hope to have an, an udder that's ready to be attached that's squeaky clean. And in the meantime, this cow is relaxed and has let down because she feels relieved. After milking, they are guided back for breakfast. Along the way, they do a little bit of primping, and they return to a clean room. That's where the beds have been made and the floors have been vacuumed. Just in time for the delivery of breakfast. And that would be a TMR that's been prepared for them, and that's delivered as they come back from the parlor. And there we have it. And so if we've done everything right, okay, we've made her world simple. And they eat, they drink, they eat more, and then they get lazy. At the same time, we have fresh cows, and they need to be looked at to make sure that they've transi transitioned in a healthy fashion. And there's one of the animal technicians just eyeballing the girls. This is Ashley and Marathon. Ashley is the one on the right, and she's going to do a physical on Marathon. 
and just making sure her room activity is good. There's no pings. There's no evidence of any pneumonia. And she's just checking her out. So there's all this attention to Cal Comfort Pay, taking away the stress, emphasis on physical well-being, which should be a no-brainer. But what about the concept of behavioral well-being that Temple Grandin talked about and our emphasis on Cal Care versus Cal Use? Are we really allowing the phenotypic expression of the genotype? Based upon our results there, I would say most definitely yes. What you saw was a 75 to 80 pound herd that basically had a 300,000 somatic cell that in turn in its entirety was moved across the road to the new facility. Within six months, the somatic cell went down to 150,000. Milk went up to about 88 pounds the first year after we put on our own forages for the second year and improved the quality of the forages, we went up to 97 pounds and held that for over a year. Components were strong at 375 and about 31 true protein. And here's the decline in the somatic cell, which currently is about 125,000 average. So the nomenclature, we call this an animal welfare-based operations management. We believe in it. It's not just the right thing to do. It's the epitome of best management practices. It allows the expression of the potential of the rations that are formulated because the girls utilize that feed most effectively when they're not stressed. So now I want to give you an example of forensics troubleshooting on this dairy, which, again, I hope you think and see is probably the epitome of cow comfort. But stuff does happen. So Wednesday, 18th November 2015, despite protests from the feeders, management, that would be me, decides to resume feeding a 2014 corn silage uh, forage from bunker silo number one. They didn't like this bunker because it was not covered and wrapped the way we normally do our bunkers. We line our bunkers when we, used, when we had bunkers with plastic, the walls, the floor, and the sides. And then when we're done filling it, we fold the flaps over on top, and we effectively made a complete envelope or bag around the forage. This minimizes waste along the bottom and the sides, and the shrink is virtually zero. And feeders enjoy feeding out of this because they don't have a lot of waste. Bunk one was the last bunk that we had done that did not have this treatment, and so it was a nuisance for them to feed. So any excuse to not feed it was embraced. So Friday, 20 November, three days later, I'm greeted at 5.30 in the morning by the feeder. Cows don't like your bunk one corn silage. <laughs> Cows are backing off feed intake. We had 5,000 pounds of refusal. That's a lot for a, a 500 cow dairy as we are. Milk has slipped by about six pounds. My reply, recheck the dry matters. Remember I said check dry matters, that's very important. Of course they said we did. I said do it again. Probably just adjusting to the change. Now, understand, bunk one was only six pounds of the 26 pounds of dry matter corn silage they were feeding, so I was very skeptical that this bunk was causing the problems. Okay. Saturday, 21st of November. 5.30 in the morning, management is greeted by the feeder. Are you happy now? Refusals were over 10,000 pounds. We're down another 10 pounds of milk. So our herd has just dropped from 97 pounds down to 80 over the course of four days. Okay, my response, huh? Okay, so where do you start? You walk onto this as a nutritionist and you say, uh, they want an answer. And now it's Saturday, so no one's open. There's no one, no one you're going to get hold of at the mill. You talk about doubting yourself, and so this is when the fun starts. First question I asked was, how are dry matter intakes? Are they down across all pens? And they said, yep. And I said, really? Well, 313, 204, and 206, not as bad. So let's look at that. Here's when the insult of the new corn silage started. You can see how... All of the pens dropped on intake, except 313 was kind of flat. It drops off here because it's a fresh pen, and we had a bunch of fresh cows coming in here, so dry matters went down as the pen got fresher. But they went through that 
very flat. Okay, and of course this is retrospective, but their their dry matter intake was not down. 204 and 206 are not on here because they're dry pens, and they also were flatlined. Okay, here's milk production, and you can see the herd dipped. Okay, across all lactating pens, except 313. It, yes, it dropped because the pen got fresher, but it did not go through that precipitous drop that all the other pens went through. So my reaction to this was, what else changed? Because 313, 204, and 206 get the same corn silage as the pens that dropped in milk. The comment I got was, you know, the cows act like they're getting shocked when they eat. They pull back after they touch the feed with their tongues. So a lot of you are thinking, how are they getting electrocuted in, in the mangers, okay? So I went and tasted the feed, and holy acrid, was it terrible. I couldn't spit fast enough to get the taste out of my mouth. What else changed? November 17th, the same day we changed corn silage, we had a new delivery of grain. I sampled the grain because I didn't know what else to do. Here's the new grain here. Here's the sample of the grain. We retained samples of all our feeds. Here's a sample of the 1115 delivery. This was the 1120, 1117 delivery. Now you can see a big difference, but in the bunk, it really doesn't look that much difference. So knowing that it tasted funny, I said, I've got to find out what's going on with this. I took 30 grams of each because that's how much these vials will hold. I added distilled water to them and pH tested them. The normal grain, the good grain, pH was 7.5. The grain that was being refused, the pH was 5.0. Up until this point, I was laboring under the assumption that the mill had inadvertently put calcium chloride in the mix instead of calcium carbonate, and that would explain why it was so acrid and why the cows would back off until this. If you look at how the feed settled out in these vials, Here's the normal one. There's the lake of liquid underneath the feed that's floating on top of it. Here's the new one. The supernatant lake is on top, and all this stuff is at the bottom. It's, it's a much heavier mix because it's all rock and mineral. And there, it's depicted there very well. You can see the two differences of the, of the supernatant and the, the lake in this one. So the questionable high feed was removed. And the cows were fed any fresh cow grain or residual research grains that we had that were free of this particular premix. Dry matters responded, responded rapidly. The delivery record showed in the mill that the mill delivered close-up close up grain, which is a negative decad in error, and they dumped it into a high cow mix. Okay. Reinstating the correct feed allowed the herd to return to former production levels of 43 kilos um, per, per day over two weeks. As of December 14th, which was about a month later, the overall herd production had gone up to over 45 kilos, or over 100 pounds of milk. The cost of this and the price of milk, not counting change of underwear, was about 16,000 U.S. dollars, plus all of the labor that went into uh, feeding the extra feed that we had stored elsewhere. But the point is, even in the best of places, mistakes happen and this stuff happens. And resolving the issue as quickly as possible saved us from milk losses even greater than we sustained. Type of opportunity uh, is out there for all feeders, whether you're a nutritionist, a veterinarian, whatever. There are situations like this that come up all the time and dissecting them and resolving them as quickly as possible, doing the forensics, if you will. Sometimes it's as simple as correcting dry matters. Other times it takes heroics and trying to figure out in a hurry what's happened to the pH of the feed and why uh, are there. And it's what keeps me getting up every day to confront the challenges. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit before we go to Bill's um, question and answer period. Remember that I'm going to have you type your questions in the chat window or the Q&A window. I don't really care which, and I'll try to catch as many as I can.
And then we'll have questions hopefully live here. We have a, an audience and, and they've been paying attention. Um, next month, we're really excited to have Mike Van Amberg. He was our first, um, first The Nutritionist speaker back in March of 2015. And he is going to talk this time about what we should do with heifers to treat them right to get better productivity. Here at the Cornell Nutrition Conference, Advanced Nutrition Conference, we've been listening to a lot about heifers and calves, and I know that we always get questions. Um, people seem to be just a little bit um, further in their understanding, further behind in their understanding, perhaps, of what they should be doing with calves, heifers, and bringing them into a high-producing milk cow. Um, so we will look forward to Mike's talk next month. I want to, before I go to the question and answer period, I just want to thank our, our people who have made this possible, Tom Taluki at AMTS USA and Global, Marcos Neves Piera, um, University of Lavras, Marcos Hans Ramos at 3R Lab, both are in Brazil, Paula Torillo in Argentina. And we also want to thank our translators in each location. Our generous sponsors make it possible for us to treat speaker to get great speakers like Bill and to manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition through Amino Acids. Our silver sponsors are Arm and Hammer Animal Nutrition, Virtus, makers of Stratus with EPA and DHA Omega 3s and Prequil with Omega 6s. Bronze sponsors are Jeffo, My Life Made Easier, Dairy One Forage Laboratory. Dairyland Laboratories, and Quality Liquid Feeds, or QLF. So I have a question, um, and this is from Paula. Is there any association between physical variation and nutrient variation of TMR across the feed bunk? So the, the nutrient variation would occur in conjunction with physical variation if sorting is going on, obviously. But if that's where you're going, if... You're asking if the physical structure would have an impact on the, the nutritional structure. Again, if, if, the, if the ration is uniformly mixed, it should not. It would be more an issue of, oh, where was it? Okay, so if the TMR is mixed properly and, and it, it is cohesive, that there's moisture enough to keep the fines and all the pieces sort of mixed together without sifting apart, then the the physical attributes should not cause a separation of the nutrients or, or, or a, um, a uh, sifting, so to speak, of the different fractions. If the TMR does not stay together as it's disturbed by the cow as she eats it, there will certainly be a drift in what she gets nutritionally. Each mouthful will not be as uniform as the previous. And the more coarse the TMR is, the more likely it is to happen. However, Wetting agents, water, molasses, um, things that are sticky, providing sugar, um, will definitely cause better cohesion and more uniform um, TMR mixes. Uh, yep, I'm here. Can you oh, hear me? Oh, good. Go ahead. Yep, I can. All right. Uh, I'm even using the phone app to do this. This is really impressive. Hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so my question is, Bill, you um, – had put in your presentation the increased milk production that you saw from just moving those cows from that old facility to the new facility, mm -hmm. and then the increase in milk production again when you guys switched to some higher quality forages that you had some more control over. Do you think there's still some genetic potential in that herd for even more milk? And if so, what do you think are the next areas to look at to try and tap that potential? Oh, that's a great question, um, because that's the question I ask all my managers. Um, I believe there is, and I'll, and I'll tell you, um, first of all, we, try, we strive for best management practices, but I can tell you up front, we're no different than anyone else. We have some shortcomings that we're dealing with. One of the issues we have is because we do way back first thing in the morning, all the bunks are cleaned out at 5.30, which is not a problem except for the fact that we then go for four hours before some of those bunks get filled again. Not by design, but I know what happens. 
And any time you go much more than three hours with an empty bunk, you can run into problems with cow slug feeding, and it's certainly not the ideal for optimizing dry matter intake. So we're looking at plans where we can possibly do waybacks sort of in a split fashion, or pens that are not on trials not do the waybacks so that more residual feed is left there up until the point that new feed is delivered. So I would submit that I think we'll see a bump again as we provide more feed to those cows more consistently throughout the day by changing our management practices that have been set up to serve us, not the cow. Okay. Right. So I think that's that's our next bump. Great. Thanks. Probably a follow-up. The question that's been um, submitted is, can we monitor variation with minimal cost and minimal time? Yes, I'm here. It, okay. it was the same I question. I, I mean, uh, is there any number uh, to use so I can monitor physical variation instead of sending samples to the laboratory to monitor variation on the field bank? Oh, um, hmm. Well, the, so probably, but the reason I... I send the samples to the lab is it, if I could probably monitor the feed as delivered with a Penn State shaker box to know that the distribution is correct. However, it wouldn't tell me if the feeder put in the right ingredients because the corn grain will shake out the same as the soy that will shake out, say, the same as the canola. And the only way I know for sure that the right ingredients are put in on the right amount is to get the chemical analysis. Now, that being said, those analyses that I'm showing you are NIR analyses um, with wet chemistry minerals. In, in the U.S., as an example, those analyses cost us somewhere in the equivalent of about so $25, $30. So that it's very cost-effective for me to do that. I recognize that if you don't – the – Nutrient analysis affords the most accurate way of knowing that the mix was done uniformly, the right ingredients were put in, and everything was delivered appropriately to the cow. There are physical markers you could put in just to know that the mix was consistently, consistently, but you wouldn't know that the accuracy of the mix was there in the analysis. And I don't do them. I only do them after I think we've arrived at the point where what a good job they're doing, and, and the feeders are very proud when they see results and know that they're doing the right work. Um, Paula says, do you think sampling error is that important so we should take duplicate samples to monitor TMR composition? When I do TMR composition, Paula, that's a great question. I make sure I take not handfuls, not um, liter bags, but many um, pounds of the TMR, I would send in for each buck probably the equivalent of four or five pounds. I tell the lab to dry the complete sample, not to subsample it, dry the complete sample, and then grind and subsample it so that they don't introduce any error at the lab. Because it is very easy to get misrepresentative uh, samples by having too small a sample of TMR. You know, recognize that a TMR nominally is probably for a cow, a high-producing cow, about 50 kilos of feed or more, and we try to, res, you know, reduce that to um, uh, a, a, less than a tenth of that, and um, and to hope that it's accurate. And what they analyze in the lab is a thimbleful, so um, you know we're talking about several grams is all they're going to analyze. So I like to make sure I give them as much representative sample, and that they process it in such a way that it represents what um, was sent in. Okay, this is a question, Bill. <laughs> From Daniel, and this is in Daniel in Argentina, to anticipate weather changes such as rain, what would be your recommendation? Hello, Daniel in Argentina. I hope you can hear me. Um, normally what we do if we're expecting a heavy rain, we will reduce the dry matter of the forages by two percentage points. So if it's in at 35 dry matter, we'll put it in at 33. 
um, and during the day, the course of the rain. The worst case of that is if it doesn't get as wet as we say, we're overfeeding the forage. But I would much rather overfeed forage than underfeed forage by having water that's there instead of feed. We do dry matters during the day and then correct it for the actual numbers. The other thing that I was going to mention that I didn't earlier is if dry matter changes much more than five points on any given day, I will never change it more than half of that amount at one time. The rationale being that maybe it's not right. And so if I change it two or two and a half points and recheck it, I'm going to be closer to the right number that way without going one extreme or the other. And then if the, if the next sample corrects me to go further, I will. But I will do it gradually because big swings result in cows with intakes that are erratic, and I'd much rather walk into the change gradually and overfeed for a day or two um, than have cows that get too much and too little and too much and too little, and um, that causes all sorts of digestive uh, upsets. Okay, and I missed the second part of that question. Um, Paula wrote it on a separate line, and it was, should we modify the quantities in our system, which is in Argentina? A lot of times the feed is not under the roof. Hmm. Um, so I assume that means if it's getting rained on. And um, I guess the, the short answer is I would do dry matters as often often as weather could impact the feed, depending upon the extent that that weather soaks into the feed. But we do dry matters here almost on a daily basis, and I can argue that there's really not a need to, but it's an effortless act with the drying ovens or even coster testers. So it's one of the, the easiest things we can do that has the most amount of reward um, and so we'll do that. Secondly, now we're feeding out of bags, and bags tend to change dry matter as you go through them because the fields are loaded basically sequentially in the bag, and there can be different dry matters in the field. It's not like a bunker silo where the face is going to be somewhat an average of what's knocked down. Um, bag will change with each um, progressive travel of a foot or more through the bag. So. Um, doing dry matters often, I think, is a great way to reinforce the importance of consistency to the feeders. We train them to do it, and so they have control, and they start to take responsibility and own the process of making sure the ration is as consistent as possible, controlling what they can control. Okay. Um, here is a question from Pedro in Argentina, okay. and this is Paula asking for Pedro to trust in NRI, NIR analysis. How many TMR samples do we need? So the NIR is only as good as the calibration, and that's where the real number of samples comes in, because the lab has to calibrate their NIR against wet chemistries of comparable feeds or TMRs. And after they have tens of thousands of samples, the NIR is a very robust measure. So in terms of how many samples do you need, I guess the way I do it is if I, if I go and sample a bunk on a given day, I will sample um, from each end in the middle and then combine all those and submit that multiple pounds, multiple kilos of that, that to the lab. And as I said, have them, have them dry the whole sample and then sub-sample it. Um, I guess, you know, how, how many that we send in the problem with that is if there's variation in the bunks, not in the lab, the only way you're going to know that is by sending in the samples. Um, I guess I, I would have a conversation with the lab, and I do this. I, I, I now just use one and make sure they understand what I am after, and I make sure I understand that they have the database that will reflect accurately the sample I'm sending in. It can be done with chemistry. It just costs a lot more. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not looking to incur that cost unless it was necessary. But but whatever the cost is, if it's at the point where you think it will demonstrate quality or you need it to motivate change because it's totally inconsistent, the one-time expense to get people to realize that what they're doing is wrong or right, I think is very memorable. And those numbers really um, reinforce the importance of, of what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. 
Um, I have a couple questions from Marcus, but I'm going to do a follow-up from Paula because it relates to that question. And um, she's asking, in the lab, how many samples can calibrate? How do they? How many samples do they use to calibrate the NIR? Do you know? Oh, yeah. The the NIR is calibrated off of tens of thousands of samples, um, at least the lab I use. So. Uh, the forge is the database is incredible, and um, we're not talking hundreds, we're talking tens of thousands in order to have um, consistent results. And um, probably only a handful of labs that can do it. But uh, I think the the cost is justifiable if it's done with a strategic purpose of affecting change, you know, for the better. Okay. Um, I have a few questions from Marcos, so I'm going to ask them sequentially. So his first question is, frequency of calibration of scales on TMR mixers, what do you recommend? Ooh. Yeah, that's a goodie. Um, so typically, when when I was managing five 3,000 cal units, I'll admit that we did it only when the scale started becoming erratic, and that's too late. Um, so what we would do monthly, at least, is drive the scale across, uh, drive the scale, drive the mixer across the scales empty, get a weight of it empty, load the mix with the amounts that were called for, and then go and weigh on the scale the mixer with the feed and see if that total weight um, aligned with how much feed was supposed to be in there according to the scale head. And that was a way of us checking periodically that the load cells were reading correctly. If there was much deviation, then we would go and, and recalibrate the load cells, which really doesn't take that long. It's just an electronic process or have a service technician come in and, and do it. But you can do it in most cases by yourself you know, on, on your own. Okay. Um, a second one from Marcos, use of fecal starch and herd, how often and how many cows sampled? Um, it, it was one of those assays that was very popular about 10 or 15 years ago, and for whatever reason, it's fallen out of favor. But we would typically sample 12 to 15 cows in a pen and, and look to see that we were getting less than 4% starch coming through. Um, most of the time, we can visually assess the fact that if there's too much too much corn in, in the manure passing, that it's going to be excessive. And so we would first, before we start spending the money on the assay, try to take steps to remediate that, correct that problem, and see to it that less corn was coming through, and then perhaps measure uh, to see where we're at. Of course, measuring first and then fixing tells you the improvement, but um, again, it's another assay that was not necessarily cheap, not expensive either, but it was cost um, justifiable only if we knew we needed it to monitor. We, we ended up doing it just by washing manure and looking how much corn grain there was in a, in a, a measured amount and saying, okay, let's do this, and then we know where we're at now, and we'll make a change, and we'll do this again in a week or two and see if the amount of corn coming through is reduced. So... Um, Measuring the amount, how much starch is lost, will certainly account for the milk production that you're not seeing, though. That's a, a measure to say, okay, the energy that we're losing is as, is as follows, and therefore we could expect we'd see this much less milk. But um, I I don't do them very often anymore, other than visually. Okay. Uh, another question from Marcos, and then we'll have some from Paula. The use of, or is analyzing the forage at filing a useful practice? <laughs> So I do it to understand what's going into the bunk to estimate what kind of feed value I'm putting up. I don't do the minerals. I, I just do it to understand my my fiber values and starch. And then um, so in, in that regard, it, it's more or less the immediate gratification of it tells me whether I harvested at the right stage of maturity. So it, it, it guides me for my next decision for the next harvest. It also tells me what I'm likely to get for feed value after that ferments because obviously there'll be some changes with the fermentation process um, here again on an NIR basis knowing what we're putting in forages it's a teachable moment for the for the nutritionist to the germ saying you know 
Um, this got away from us. It's a little more mature than we'd like. If it was something that could be controlled, it couldn't be because of weather. I don't know. It don't have to be tactful, obviously. But um, I think there's some merit in it to, to do um, a, a couple of samples out of every field just to understand what that bunk is like to be when it comes time to feed it. Marco, uh, Marcos asked, could you elaborate a little more on TMR sampling, sample size, and numbers of samples, et cetera? Sure. Um, basically, I, I have a, a large tub or bucket. I go down through with a shovel-type device so that I can get under the TMR and pick up an amount and dump it into the, the tub without losing any fines or other material falling down through. I'll sample um, a, a, a bunk manger in at least three places, maybe four along the way before the cows have touched the feed and um, put that all in the tub. So now I've got probably, oh, at least five, maybe even 10 kilos of feed, probably more like 10 kilos in there. And then I mix that all up and I subsample that and send to the lab probably um, three kilos worth of that feed and uh, um, that I've subsampled and um, request that to be dried and ground and then subsampled for analysis. Okay. Um, this is a question from our audience here. Do you find that when there are mixer scale errors that they are consistent from one pound to thousands of pounds, or do they tend to be at one end of the weight spectrum? Yeah, they, they definitely drift with the load cell when it goes bad. It seems to have more error on one extreme or the other. Most of the time, it seems like it's on the smaller loads than the larger loads. Um, as you load them, they seem to, to acquire the robustness to be a little more accurate as they deflect and um, they're creating a resist, electrical resistance and impedance. But um, uh, usually once they're bad at either extreme, you know, we would try to recalibrate them or then, if not, just replace them because what's involved in terms of feed error is going to be a lot more costly than putting up with something that in a drift in terms of accuracy. You just don't know if you're feeding what you think you're feeding as you're adding ingredients. Okay. Um, do, do you do any sampling of the animal to monitor the adequacy of the mineral feeding? So maybe blood sampling? We so we will do um, serum chemistries for macro minerals on uh, cows when they calve in to make sure calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus levels are good. We feed um, organic trace minerals, chelated minerals, to the uh, lactating and dry cows. So I'm reasonably confident they're getting those. But if I have any question, I will take blood samples. And here, when you're doing traces and vitamins especially, you've got to have the right tubes or your results are meaningless. So talk to your lab before you do this. Because, for instance, you can't use red top stopper tubes. For serum, uh, if you're going to do a assay, there's too much zinc in the rubber stopper. It's going to contaminate the results, as an example. Um, so I, I will do that, but I will always talk first to the lab and make sure they know what samples they want, and I'll even have them send me the tubes that they want me to take samples in so there's no confounding of the results. But um, I only do that if there's a question as to whether or not the cows are absorbing the mineral or and or vitamins from the feed for some reason, or they're being destroyed by heat, or they're not being put in at all. Okay, Now, you could have the feed acid for that as well. The, the reason for doing the cow is if it's a chelated mineral, it should be more bioavailable, and you'd hope that they would absorb it as opposed to an oxide um, form of a mineral where we know the, the bioavailability of those mineral salts is not as good. Um, what about liver sample? We do biopsies, um, but most of that is for metabolic function and, and looking at fat and liver function. Um, to to biopsy to, for checking traces is not something that we do routinely because, frankly, we don't see a lot of evidence of trace mineral deficiencies because we're using the chelates. Um, our reproduction is very strong. The 21-day the pregnancy rate is somewhere between 28 and 32. If we had any amount of trace 
to mineral deficiencies, I think we would see it show up in reproductive um, performance failure. But yes, you could do liver biopsies if you wanted to go that route for copper and things like that. Yes. Marcos in Brazil, what would your standard recommendation for pushing feed times per day be? Um, at least one more time than it's being done now. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure this ever too often, but certainly strategic timing of making sure a feed is pushed up when cows are most likely to be in a in a hungry mode. So coming back from the parlor, um, at least once in between milkings would be indicated. And so I think our bunks get pushed up an average of four, maybe five times a day, and we milk three times a day. And, so, and, and again, it, to me, it never hurts to call their attention to the fact that there's seed up there by pushing up feed and just creating interest on the part of the cow. This is from Paula in Argentina, and this is Marco. About training feeders, in your experience, what would be a good training frequency? Which are the most important topics that you talk to feeders about? Hmm. So, yeah, the the feeders that did the results that I showed you of the four samples that were almost identical, uh, I probably worked with those guys for six months before they believed that I wasn't going away and that I was going to you know, stay on, on their backs until they got this right. And then we became friends because they, they saw the results and they felt good about it. Um, I guess the, the training is more reflective of when people turn over, when you know you lose personnel and you have new people coming in. Most feeders that take pride in their work want to own it, and once they get it right, you know I can I can print from the computer the feed error sheet and show what a good job they're doing, so they they can see that and and you know relate to that. Oh, that we see that they're doing a good job. I think is very important in training leaders. They have to know that you're watching. They have to know that you appreciate it, and they have to know that they're, that the feeder is the one who has to control over whether this is properly or not. Um, um, what was the second part of the question? What are the important topics that you talk to feeders about? Oh yeah, well, the the um, I call the bunks. In other words, I adjust dry matter intakes at the start and then I try to find someone who shows interest and aptitude and I train them how to call feed as what well, we should reduce the amount of feed offered. But doing dry matters to me is an essential part of a feeder's responsibility. And they start to understand they're the ones that when they pick up a bucket of feed, they know whether that feed has gotten heavier or not. They know whether they do dry matter um on that forage and they have changed. And I think that dry matter is probably the most significant and important thing that they can be doing. The same thing is we teach them how to sample the forages because we send in samples weekly from the large pumps just to know that our forages aren't drifting that much in analysis. So that's a, um, another, but again, it's not just a matter of grabbing full of feed, knowing how to subsample a representative amount of that feed and package it so it goes in and you get meaningful results. Um, boxes just to evaluate whether or not our size of the feed has changed. Um, I don't I don't, you know, off that as anything important. But if they want to do it, to learn, I think it's a great thing to do. Again, I want them to own the process. Okay. Um, this is a question from our audience here. On the subject of forage harvest quality, do you find that pre-harvest mm -hmm. meetings of owner, nutritionist, chopping crew to set expectations tends to lessen variation in forage quality? Lessen, yes, lessen variation in forage quality. Yeah, I think um, when I had five 3,000 cow dairies that I oversaw and we had four crews chopping all at the same time uh, for harvest, it was critical that we came together and refocused on what the purpose is of what we're doing. It's not just to get done. The, the um, What we accomplish is critical, and everyone's busy. Everyone just wants to get the job done, understanding how to get it done right and what we're after. And to that end, what I will do is, as feeds come in, especially corn silage, I would stay there with a Penn State box and shake out samples and look to make sure kernels were processed, and I would send those back to the chopper to show him that he was doing a good job or show him that there might have to be some adjustments. 
And I found that all um, custom operators that, that run the choppers are get fed up with people saying, you know, the, the portal has to be taken down. But well, I could show them that the cor- these weren't broken, and then after they made the adjustment, I could show them that the corals were broken. They really understood that I wasn't just trying to be a pain in the back, okay, that um, there was a reason for it. And then they started to appreciate what they were doing. And, and so I, I think any time we can reinforce and, and, and appreciate work done, um, it goes a long way of getting the results that we better expect. And I have another question here. What size herd does it take to justify feed watch cost? Um, we use feed watch and we have 600 cows. Um, the, it does having the software to affect better process control pay back. And given that feed after labor, at least in the U.S., you know, is a major expense, anything I can do to eliminate the variation in feed and monitor that process and ensure better mixing, I think, pay back if I'm going to be in business any amount of time. Um, I know, and there are other options besides Feedwatch. There are other um, companies that have comparable products that are good, and there's, there are others out there that I would not recommend. But um, uh, I think having uh, computerized feeding systems, you know, is certainly the way to go. You can, depending upon your size, you don't have to have a radio um, on the fly transmission of data from the tractor to the computer and back and forth, they can come in and upload changes from the computer in the office. So there's you can do it you don't have to um think about money up front, but you just look at the computer uh things and the error uh be used for inventory. Uh, I think some software for her thousand up only Bill's looking at me because there is actually a lag, and I can hear that it hasn't finished delivering on his part. So, um, I have a question from Paula Torillo, and this is from Ezekiel. Most of our feed bunks are canvas or wood feed bunks, not concrete, so we don't push feed up. Do you think we should increase delivery frequency so there's fresh feed along the day? Yeah, so fresh feed is, is absolutely critical. Um, summertime in certain parts of the U.S. go to twice or even three times a day feeding for that very reason so that the freshest feed is put in front of the cows. And time, obviously, but certainly if you mix more often and provide fresher feed, it should be reflected in better intakes. The downside besides the cost of it the more often you mix feed, the more often you're likely to have errors of mixing. Okay, it's simple. The more times you do it, the better the chances you're going to make a mistake. All things being considered, if I trusted my feed, I would opt to feed more time a day than once a day and push up um, to make sure that the best feed was available more often. So I optimized or optimized dry matter into. Um, I don't have any more questions from Paula or Marcos. Um, so I think that that ends it for our questions, unless I get something quick in my question and answer window or in the chat window. Um, we're going to thank Bill for a great presentation. He was very modestly asking why anybody would want to listen to him, but I think we all like to hear what each of us have, each of the a good experienced nutritionist, what they experience and what they look for. Everybody likes to learn. So thank you again. Bill for this presentation and thank you guys for attending and thank you in Argentina and Brazil I am not even going to attempt to unmute you to say thank you I know that Paula says thank you and I know that Marco says thank you this has been a fun webinar in terms of audio I hope that you all could hear adequately and I apologize for our audio failures so have a good night, and we'll say goodbye, and be sure to listen next month. Thanks very much. Bye.